this piece of history has a real beauty to it. It's, I suppose it's a, it's an Easter egg, if you will, hidden in plain sight. And it's been hiding in plain sight for more than a century. See, after the Brisbane area was opened as a free settlement in 1842, places like Redcliffe were resettled and other places sprang up like Sandgate, Nudgee or Caboolture and other towns. These towns were separated by lots of bush, roaming tribes of Aboriginals, bush rangers, and the roads, well, they looked like this. Thus, ships were the safest option. So, people would use ships for, well, everything. There were ships taking timber from places like uh, Campbellville back to Brisbane. People were using, there was ships going between Ipswich and Brisbane. Yeah, ships were used for everything. So, with such insufficient transport, people would often approach fishermen and the like, and they'd be like, well, can we bum a lift? Say, I want to go to Bribey Island. Can, can, I, can I catch a lift with you, Mr. Fisherman? Oh, oh yeah, the uh, Bribey, you say? Yeah, yeah, I can take you to Bribey. Um, it's a bit out of way for me. For two shillings, I'll take you to Bribey. You give me two shillings, I'll take you to Bribey. Ah, oh, cheers. As you might imagine, as the population went up, so did the need. So every bloke with a boat became a bit like a man with a van. Because they were so needed, they could name their price. And their prices just kept on rising and rising, soon to ridiculous levels. Oh, Cuban cigar, single malt whiskey. Oh, I love money. Yes, I do. Oh, oh hey. Bribey Island, wasn't it? I'm afraid that'll be 10 shillings. So as the money went up, so did the competition. Soon every bloke with a boat was trying to make a quid. There were heaps of boats and ships plying the waves all around Brisbane, but the only one of importance at this stage of the video is the Boko, but I'll talk about her later. In the late 1870s, something happens. Now it seems small on the surface, but this thing is about to change Brisbane's history forever. This doesn't just change Brisbane as we know it, it changes the whole of Moreton Bay because it's about to become a playground. By the 1880s, this activity had become so popular that every ship leaving for this activity would be so packed they'd have to turn people away because they couldn't fit them on the ships. So they buy more ships, and guess what happens to them? They too get filled to the gunnels. Because what these shipping companies had offered for the first time were excursions and holidays. The crowds only grow, and in 1911, Brisbane gets the Cooper, and she can carry 1,200 people. Guess how many people she has on her maiden voyage from Brisbane to Redcliffe? Oh, she only has 1,140 people. Think about that. That's insane. That's a, that's a one Australian town worth of people just going to one spot. Upon... Reaching Redcliffe, 1,140 people jump off the ship. And guess how many people get on? 1,000 people. Like, how, where do these people come from? Not from, like, from, from Redcliffe, did all their relatives think, oh, let's go to the big smoke, and they jumped on the ship. And they come back, and a 1,000 people get off the ship at Brisbane. That's insane. Now, if that wasn't like crazy as it is, like 1,000 people jumping back on the boat, when they get back to Brisbane, these 1,000 people jump off, right? Which is normal. But get this, 1,100 people were like, oh, we missed the boat going in the morning, so we wanna go now. So 1,100 people jump on and they go back to Redcliffe and they, they jump off. And that's on the first day. As you might imagine, with so many people getting on and off in one place, it created its own little microcosm of jobs. Every hawker who sold anything from ice cream to oysters would set up their stalls 
to wait for those getting on and off the ships. This is one island and they're like, we could really do with the tourism. Could you add us to your stops? We have a really fantastic island. We could really do with the business and you know, you could do with a fantastic stop. So the Cooper adds this island to its uh, itinerary. And I suspect this is what starts our love affair with Bribie because that island was Bribie Island. You read some of the stories about some of the things that were selling on Bribie and they're insane, you know. Uh, I remember this one story and if imagine that this is a tent. So it was a hawker and he was selling tents, which isn't that abnormal, you know. Buy a tent from me, my tents are the best. Buy from me, buy only from me, I've got the best tents. That's not that abnormal until you see what the other guy was selling. Buy your tent poles from me. This, look at this tent pole. It's the best tent pole you'll get. It's sexy, it's sleek. Buy only from me. So imagine that. You go to a place where one bloke is selling tents. Not that abnormal. But he's not selling them with tent poles. You have to go to another buyer to buy a tent pole. Imagine if you, you didn't meet the guy with the tent pole, he went to the toilet or something like that. Buy a tent, you go camping and it hasn't got any tent poles. That's insane. They might have had their crazy beginnings on Bribey, but like everywhere else, this vital service caused jobs to flourish there too. Another thing that is sort of funny and cute is that as soon as the Cooper birthed at Bribey, there would appear to be great welcoming crowds of locals waiting for them. <laughs> but the truth was there was a pub on the ship, not on the island. So the people waiting to get off the ship would be excited about their holiday, and the people waiting to get on the ship were probably excited to drink. But I suspect their happiness was probably fairly contagious. Crazy thing is, soon they needed a bigger ship, because the Cooper couldn't handle all the traffic. So... The company bought another ship that could carry more than 1,500 people. This ship was the Doomba, and it entered service in 1923. Bizarrely, it was originally a minesweeper of all things, but they turned it into serious, serious luxury. Now, the Doomba was absolute luxury. They made this thing look absolutely sublime. It had lounges, it had cafes, it had a smoking room, oh, it had it all and it was uh, it was actually even quicker, it was faster than the Cooper and uh, yeah quite an amazing ship. Sadly this ship did not run very long because something else made it pretty obsolete and that was cars and better roads. See, in 1935, the Hornybrook Bridge was completed, and in 1936, the Doomba sailed her last trip. After this, she was sent to work in New South Wales, and later, she was reconverted back into a Navy ship for World War II. And in 1976, she was sunk near Sydney as a fish breeding reef. But what of the Bocco and that of the Cooper? What, what, what happened to them? The Bocco became obsolete after the Cooper came into service and was stripped of all things of value and left over here. These are the pictures we have of her, and what's cool is she was abandoned in 1917. So she's been in this location for 107 years. Let me show you what's left of her, because out of the two of them, she's the most well-preserved. Amazing, really. So this is a boiler. All the steam would have been pushed through here so it could turn like a paddle wheel on the side of the ship, I believe. Oh, that's so cool. It's amazing. The amount of pressure that would have been in this thing. Now it's just... It's just astonishing, really. Now the ship that I'm about to show you is rather immense. It is astonishingly large. But, I mean, if I pointed my camera around, it wouldn't really show you the extensity of it. So let me just pop my camera down and move from, I'll pop my camera at the back of the ship and I'll walk all the way to the front and I'll show you, I'll try and show you the immensity of this thing because it's absolutely whopping. Those engines that we saw would have easily fitted in it. Most of this thing has been scrapped but what's left of it is still rather extraordinary.
you see these weird looking bricks here and the strange looking things i reckon from what i've seen actually that might be a piece a little bit of the ballast so what they'd do is they'd leave like stones and stuff at the bottom of a ship to give it more buoyancy and actually if you walk over here a bit further up you've still got big chunks of it so this is actually quite well intact i'm actually really impressed so look looks like a bit of the upper decking and the reason i think that is it's flat let me just zoom out Do you see how they're like chunks of like flat stuff i reckon this probably was a big chunk of the piece of the decking that's a theory of course but look the wreckage is all all over here if you go back up that way that's where you have the boilers and then there's the ship the carcass is over there it's actually really well intact i'm really impressed anyway look if being up to your knees in photed stinking mangrove mud isn't your kind of fun well finding the cooper is probably going to be more for you See, the Cooper did her last run in 1953, but unfortunately, like the Doomba, it too found itself unable to generate sufficient income. So, in 1960, she was dragged to the mouth of the Brisbane River and mostly cut up for scrap. You can find what's left of her about here. This, bizarrely, what you're seeing right in front of you, this is the Cooper. This is what's left of it. The best time to see this thing is at uh, low tide. See, that's the thing, you know, the fishermen, the, all the other ships, the, the, the Boko, the Cooper, the Doomba. See, they started something. They started, they started people going on trips and excursions. And this in turn started to create quite a lot of industry. See, today, I suppose we have the the Tangaluma ferries that go to Tangaluma Island and there's so much industry created there, isn't there? You know, there's the Cat of Nine Tails that takes people to, on excursions to St. Helena Island. Our ancestors, when they were on these ships, they listened to orchestras. Well, tell me this, ever seen a party boat busting out mad tunes on the river? Did our ancestors use ferries? Well, of course they did. Tell me this, ever been on a city cat? So look, it probably takes multiple forms and has different companies and different names, but it is essentially all the same kind of stuff. It, this stuff didn't become history, it became tradition. And it's still with us today, hidden in plain sight, in front of our very noses. So if you learnt something new, please like and subscribe. Cheers. Thanks.